Mm. Mm. Almost there. Mm. All right. Yeah, you got it. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, when you start a new project, to ensure success, you have to have the right tools. Just like in a video game, you have to understand the fundamentals to be able to make it to the end. You know, the first step is always the trickiest and the most difficult, but I'm gonna make sure you're prepared so you have absolute success. All right, let's have a go at it again. Yeah. I love to grow herbs of all kinds because I think, well, they're beautiful and very useful, incredibly fragrant. And you know, this little garden doesn't take up much space. This is one of my little four foot square raised beds. You see, it's only 10 inches tall, so I used two by 10 lumber and made this four by four bed, and I filled it with soil that drains well. It's placed in full sun because herbs love full sun. And in this bed, I have 15 plants. So just let me go through with you the variety that I have here. In the corner I have rosemary, followed by three plants of chives, yummy on potatoes. And then look, this is flat leaf Italian parsley, two plants of that, and then two plants of curly leaf parsley. And then I have two sweet basil plants. And then along here I have one pot of mint, a chocolate mint, a Greek oregano, and a thyme. Now, if you don't have this much room, or you don't feel like you have the time to grow a garden of this size, let's step over here and let me show you another one. Now take a look at this little herb setup. It doesn't take much space. We're growing herbs on the vertical, if you will. And I'm using three pots. I've got an eight inch pot of rosemary here, and I have it sitting in a 16 inch pot with lemon verbena in it, which is really fragrant. And just below it, I have a 20 inch container with lemon thyme cascading over the edge. And of course, I have a saucer here to help keep them all hydrated. This is a fun way to grow herbs. And you could come up with your own combination. These were just some that I had on hand and thought they would look good together. You can place this in full sun and not only will it produce a lot of herbs for you, it's got a really cool look to it. When we talk about fertilizer, we're basically talking about plant food. By definition, it's any substance that's added to the soil to supply one or more nutrients, essentially for the growth of plants. The thing is, healthy, well-fed plants tend to have a higher production level. That just makes sense. You'll see anywhere from double to triple crop yields with your vegetables and herbs just by adding fertilizer to the soil. Another benefit is that healthy plants take up nutrients and water more efficiently which means I spend less time watering. When you look at fertilizer packaging, you'll notice NPK. These are the symbols for three key elements that help plants perform their best. Nitrogen, denoted with an N, helps plant foliage to grow strong. Phosphorus, denoted with a P, helps roots and flowers grow and develop. And potassium, denoted with a K, is important for overall plant health regulates metabolism and water absorption. Now when it comes to applying fertilizer, I often use a water-soluble formula. It's great for establishing plants and can be used throughout the growing season. If you haven't fertilized in the past, give it a try this year. You'll be amazed the way your plants will perform. Understanding the light in your garden is critical if you want to grow a lot of beautiful vegetables. For instance, if you look on the tag of a plant or a back of a seed pack, it'll say full sun, partial sun, part shade, full shade. Let's just talk about what that means for just a moment. Full sun means six continuous hours of sunlight. Now you can have afternoon sun, you know that range of time from three when it's really hot all the way till sunset in the summer. Or you can have morning sun, which you know is from sunrise up until about one o'clock 
or maybe two o'clock in the afternoon. That morning sun is easier on vegetables, particularly in really hot parts of the country. Now, there are certain vegetables in high summer that can really take a lot of hot sun. Plants like okra, sweet potatoes, green beans, even peppers. But I found my tomatoes tend to like a little break from the hot sun. So that morning sun is really good for those. And then cool weather crops. If you're trying to bring those into the hot summer, things like cabbage and kale and lettuce and arugula, a little protection from that hot afternoon sun is really good for them. For instance, this squash, this is zucchini squash, one of my favorites, loves full sun. It'll thrive in that hot afternoon sun, but it'll also do equally well in morning sun, the sun that we get in the east. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Over here, on this side of the building, I've got some vegetables growing in containers. It's a great way to grow vegetables, but again, light is very important. I have shard, I have sorrel, and there's more shard over there. And look how beautifully it's growing. These plants only get morning sun from dawn up until about noon. So they get six hours of that early morning sun and they're doing very well, even in the hottest part of summer. Okay, now let's reverse things. We've talked about sun, let's talk about shade. When you talk about partial shade, that is an area that gets less than six hours up to about three hours of sun a day. If you're talking about full shade, that's an area that only gets about three hours of sun. Now, if you're trying to grow vegetables in partial shade, you've got more latitude. But if you're trying to grow vegetables in shade, where you only get three hours of light, you're gonna be restricted to growing things like Italian parsley, leafy lettuces, and things like that. And of course, if you have containers, you can move them around. That's the great thing about them. If you're planting under a tree, well, you wanna make sure that you're planting way out from the root zone if you can. And also, grow on trellises, things that can reach up and find the sun, something to consider. Things like green beans and cucumbers even. You know, about once a week, I come out here and encourage my cucumbers to go up on the fence. Just take a look at this. You see how these vines will begin to cling to this fence? This is what I call a space-saving technique. Cucumbers come equipped with their own little tendrils and they'll begin to tie themselves up to the fence. They do it all by themselves. All you have to do is encourage them. And so by weaving a few of these ends into the fence, these tendrils will reach around and wrap around it and hold them there. And then you have cucumbers hanging down all along this fence. It's a great way to harvest. Now this variety of cucumber is a lemon cucumber. It's an Asian variety. And if you look under here, you'll see, here's one right here, one of our first. There you go, look at that. These are really delicious. I just love them and they are really, really easy to grow. Now, one of the things that you'll notice here, look at all the blooms. It's very important that we have pollinators. So bumblebees, uh, honeybees, they're all welcome to play around in the cucumbers and go from one flower to the next because the more they pollinate, the more cucumbers we grow. Let's go over to the next fence. Let me show you a Boston pickling cucumber. So you can see here, these are growing very well also. You can see we're already getting some fruit here on this. Look at that, look at that little cucumber. And here's some here as well. These will grow about six to seven inches long. And these are delicious as the name implies for pickles. Who doesn't love pickles? Both of these varieties, the lemon, which I really love fresh, and the pickling cucumbers I love in pickles. And what we've done is we've spaced them about four feet apart. There are a couple of plants in each one of these areas. And within a couple of weeks, these cucumber vines will cover this entire fence. It'll look like a wall of cucumbers. Now, one of the things to keep in mind with cucumbers is um, you wanna make sure that you go along and keep them picked because um, they can get away from you. And what you'll do is you'll get these giant cucumbers in here like that one. It's already getting too large and it's already beginning to yellow. They'll, they'll just seem to grow overnight. You need to check them regularly because this is a perfect size for pickling. That's what you want. And you wanna keep these big ones off because what they're gonna do is they're just gonna drain the plant of its energy. If you keep them picked, you're gonna get more and more cucumbers. You're not gonna exhaust the vines. When creating a garden, there are two types of plants that I pay particular attention to. 
because they create the mainstay or the framework of the garden. That would be shrubs and perennials. If you'll look behind me, you'll see this broadleaf evergreen, a large evergreen shrub. In front of it, I've planted Russian sage, a wonderful perennial that comes back year after year. And here you can see the salvia leucantha, and as it spills down, you can begin to add annual color for that pop in every season. For instance, here, I've got Caryopteris in the back with that evergreen or Osmanthus in the back. And then here, we see perennials in the way of this Gara. This is Terenia, contrasted to the sweet potato vine leaf. And here along the edge is this beautiful little Macedonia. Now, these add that visual pop with color, but it's really these shrubs and perennials that can provide a sense of enclosure, and also they can help you frame your garden beds. When laying out a garden, you have to set priorities, and the top priorities for me are always the shrubs and perennials, because you see these are more permanent. They're going to stay in your garden year after year. Now you want to be particularly mindful of their mature size, because they can grow for years and can sometimes outgrow their space. In terms of size and shape, many of the evergreen shrubs are more easy to manipulate through pruning, although they aren't quite as colorful as something like a hydrangea or an azalea, which will give you beautiful blooms. But they're certainly not as compelling once the flowers fade or the foliage dies back. I think the real point to keep in mind here is the framework of the garden. By choosing the right plant carefully and placing it in the right place, you can have a framework that will give you a satisfying garden for years to come. Just like Narcissus looked at his reflection forever, I could look at these beautiful flowers forever. These hardy perennials are great addition to any garden, and they're so easy to care for. Planting bulbs can be tricky, so we'll help you get started with our primer for beginners. I'm Brent Heath. I'm a daffodil hybridizer. That means I get to be a bee in the hands of the Lord. I go around and spread pollen from one flower to another and harvest the seeds and get to name a select few hybrids. But I also own a mail order flower bulb business in Virginia and also in the Netherlands. This hillside of daffodils, it's just, uh, they're here dancing in the breeze, they're happy campers. It's so nice to see plants growing well. Daffodil is the good Lord's almost perfect flower. They're native predominantly to Western Europe. Daffodils, are members of the amaryllis plant family. All members of the amaryllis plant family contain alkaloids, which are poisonous to critters. So daffodils are critter-proof. Great, a great thing in gardening. Secondly, daffodils are sun lovers. They do best in full sun. They are only slightly shade tolerant if they're early bloomers and get most of their growth before the leaves come on the trees but they are such happy flowers. You know, yellow, the predominantly yellow, but also whites and variations of orange and pink. But uh, that yellow color is the first color our eye separates, and it's such a bright, happy color. You want to plant daffodils in the autumn, and typically bulbs root best when soil temps are between 50 and 60 degrees, so typically after your first frost and you want to plant right up until the time that the ground freezes because the bulbs want to make roots. Once they make roots, they don't freeze. And remember, plant them in the sunlight. Um, plant about four bulbs to the square foot to get a nice coverage, to, but to allow them to multiply well. Dig a hole three times the height of the bulb deep, and they are best in a sandy, loamy soil, which everybody gardens on. The world's most numerous daffodil is often thought to be a yellow trumpet where the trumpet or corona is longer than the petals. And it's called King Alfred, or it was called King Alfred. It's a name that Madison Avenue popularized to the point where most people think yellow daffodils are King Alfreds. King Alfred went extinct 50 years ago. 
And today, the world's most numerous daffodil is a cute little one called Tete-a-Tete. Tete-a-Tete's a miniature daffodil, but it's super good for growing on pots and for forcing. So Tete-a-Tete is now the world's most numerous daffodil, more bulbs of it than any other. You know, we're part of this nature that we're amongst, and we've become a part from it, and I enjoy helping to reconnect people to the earth that we're part of, helping them to realize that our lives do impact the earth. We can impact the earth in a positive way, so we can have a sustainability into the future. And the flowers are so wonderful because the flowers infect people with smiles. A time-honored way to cook is to poach, and you can poach in water or something even more delicious. Regina, what about some tips on poaching? Well, let me tell you my tip on poaching. Water is a great way to poach, but if you add a little white wine mm -hmm, to nothing it, wrong with that. nothing better. I bring my water and wine to a roaring boil. I turn it off, and then I add my fish to it, and then I let it sit in the hot water to poach. That way, you're you're not overcooking your fish. Sure. If it's not cooking fast enough, you can always put the fire on just a little bit. Sure. But Great I tip. love poaching for the summer. I do my fish, serve it with a nice little chilled sauce like mayonnaise with Dijon and capers. Mm. And you can do that ahead with vegetables and you have a lovely summer dish. Perfect. How easy and is that? And moist. Easy is good. Mm, sounds perfect. Now for some other tips on poaching from some of my favorite chefs. Hi, I'm Anthony Devote from Five Bistro in St. Louis, uh, and I have a great tip for poaching eggs at home. And what you're gonna wanna do is take a measuring cup, and then we're gonna take a little bit of saran wrap or plastic wrap, and just kinda press it into the cup. Uh, we're gonna crack our egg, we're gonna drop it right down in there, right in the center. A Little bit of salt, a little crack of pepper, and we're gonna pull it right together. We're gonna just give it a little spin, and then we're gonna just tie off the top with a twisty tie. We're gonna drop that in our boiling water and what that's gonna do is it's gonna help us keep our shape of the egg. Pull it out, just give it a little touch on the bottom and make sure that it's uh, nice and firm. And there's a great tip for uh, poaching eggs at home. Here at 1620 Savoy, the labor of love, poaching beef, a filet mignon, Poaching beef, you really want to use a very strong, bold wine, a Cote de Rhone, a uh, Cabernet, if you have enough, a Bordeaux. Um, but it's a very delicate and time-consuming technique, but it works beautifully. Once the uh, filet is poached, then you'll remove it, let it chill completely, then you're ready to sear it. And the end result, you get a nice, really rich, flavorful piece of beef with a nice wine accent to it. The actual poaching liquid can be reduced down to be used as a sauce. It's just a wonderful, wonderful technique for uh, something out of the ordinary with beef tenderloin. You know, Kathy, I find that when people are thinking about having a few chickens that they're often dealing with some misconceptions which often aren't true. A lot of people um, I find will tell, tell me stories on Facebook about a negative experience they had with a rooster on their grandmother's oh, right, farm. right, right. Um, I, I hear these as well. Yeah. And, the mean old rooster. And it's unfortunate <laughs> because roosters really aren't mean. And, no, they're not. Um, when they are aggressive or territorial, it's just because they're doing their job. That's right, they're being a rooster. That's what they're supposed to do. Right. That's what we pay them for. Some roosters, um, you know, are really quite gentle, and I find that certain breeds are more gentle than others. I'm sure you've seen that. You know, I have, I've had more than a few roosters in my flock, and I've never had an aggressive rooster. Mm -hmm. There's not a way to predict which rooster is going to be aggressive. There's also not a way to socialize a rooster not to be aggressive. That's right. Once, if, they're go if they've kind of got that 
in them, they're going to stay that way. Right. Yeah, it's I, better to find another home for him. Agreed. An aggressive, territorial, um, alert rooster will, <laughs> uh, one today. will be worth his weight in gold on a farm. Well, Kathy, you know, these Sussex are a very gentle breed. Uh, this light Sussex is one of my favorites. And this little guy in here, he's a big teddy bear. You know, the other thing that I think is so interesting, people think that chickens are smelly, you know, and they don't want them for that reason. That's a common misconception, actually. Chickens themselves are not smelly. No. It's the animal waste of any animal. Like here, we use wood shavings, and uh, we put down new shavings uh, every two weeks or so, and it smells very fresh. It smells like pine in here. <laughs> and that's how it should smell, and uh, a well-kept chicken yard will not smell like chicken waste. And then the, this idea of people say that, oh, I don't have time. You know, it's, it's a lot of work to keep chickens. You know, I, I just don't think that's the case at all. I don't think they realize that you can have waterers and feeders that'll feed them up to a week. That's true. Uh, poultry nipple watering systems that you can hook up to a hose will run continuously. Clean, fresh water 24-7. That's right. Um, you can still go on the vacation you want to take. That's right, and very inexpensively. You can also uh, implement a treadle feeder, which is a, a feeder that the chickens need to step onto in order to activate it and to reach the feed. That's right. Yeah. Um, that eliminates rodent problems, that uh, eliminates concerns about going away on vacation. Yeah. And that you don't have to have a lot of space either. This is an 8 by 8 pen. It opens up into a larger run, but in here, we have six chickens, which is a perfect number for this space. Oh, and they're perfectly happy in here. There's plenty of plenty of room in here for them. It's a nice breeze, plenty of light. Everyone's happy laying eggs, I see. <laughs> they are, plenty of eggs. We have to gather them today. Right. I think we should launch a campaign that every person should have chickens in their backyard. I'm all for it. That's great. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I finish a project, that feeling of accomplishment is really marvelous. Now, when I finish a garden project, that feeling comes back over and over because the garden is one of those gifts that just keeps on giving. Just enjoying all of the beauty and the bounty that your plants can provide, well, it just perpetuates those good feelings all year long. You know, the main thing to do when you're taking on a project is to just get the basics down and then jump in there and get a little crazy. Have some fun. You never know what you might come up with. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. The other thing that I think is so interesting, people think that chickens are smelly you know, and they don't want them for that reason. It's true. Of course, the thing that I also hear, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's very, very calm. Why don't you have these fellows under contract that they need to be quiet when you're filming?